Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. This is the eighth video in the internal style contrasting series. Again, just like the last video, I will keep talking about some abstract topics in this video instead of focusing on any specific physical areas in our body. I believe that focusing on physical movement will only take you so far in martial art training. You need to understand the concept and the fundamentals behind the movement in order to grasp the essence of a style. That is my main motivation behind introducing such abstract topics and hopefully this will help you understand the traditional practice better. More than 10 years ago, I shot an interview series with the help of some of my students where I talked about my views and experiences with the internal martial arts. In the interview, I claimed that there was a relationship between a style and its weapons training and I provided some examples to support my claim. However, back then, there were two issues. First, I did not elaborate that claim in detail. Second, I did not use the imagery concept to explain the martial phenomenon. As a result, even though many people accepted it, the limitation of the interview format didn't allow me to go into detail. Due to this, I was not able to provide a deeper understanding. Anyway, I would recommend you watch the video series as well whenever time permits. If nothing else, you can at least notice how much I have improved over the years. For many years after that interview series, I had been thinking of elaborating the weapon imagery concept but was always pressed for time. Who would have thought a virus would give me this opportunity? Anyway, topics covered in today's video include first, bare hand versus weapon. Second, imagery of a weapon in bare hand practice. Three, internal style and their weapons imageries. Fourth, demonstration, fifth, take aways. Again, this video does not focus on how to practice a weapon. Instead, it focuses on how to practice a bare hand techniques based on a weapon's imagery. So, let's get started. Topic 1. Bare hand versus weapon. In prior videos, I mentioned that according to Chinese history, a weapon's systematic training existed and developed much earlier and compared to bare hand practice. Throughout the history of ancient China, spanning thousands of years, bare hand training was just a complementary training curriculum to weapon systems. The reason was very simple that Weapons was a lot more effective in ancient battlefield, while bare hand were only a last resort. If you read any ancient military training manuals, you will notice weapons training to be of primary importance. Of course, some documents do mention bare hand training as well, especially the one that were written less than 600 years ago. However, the training methods described were very basic. For example, there is not a concept of routine in bare hand training. Instead, there are only some postures or shi in Chinese. For example, in Ji Yao Xin Shu, the most prominent military training manual written by General Qi Ji Guang in the Ming Dynasty around the 1500s. There are many postures introduced for military training. If bare hand training 
wasn't giving a lot of importance in the military. What was the situation among civilians? Well, civilians focused a lot on bare hand training. Let me share a bit of history to explain this. In Chinese history, there has have been many instances of dynasties imposing laws to forbid civilians from practicing weapons based on martial art. This term is Jin Wu Ling, or forbid martial order. Please keep in mind that the laws in Chinese history mostly used to stop people practicing martial arts were only applied in weapons training, not the bare hand parts. According to historians' research, the earliest government law to forbid civilian possession of weapons was in the Qin Dynasty, about 221 to 207 BCE. It was said that after he unified China, the first emperor of China ordered the confiscation of all the unnecessary weapons, brought them to its capital, and melted them to cast twelve huge metal statues. By the way, this photo does not show the original metal status, since those were destroyed in later wars. During the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1912, some emperors even announced that civilians were not allowed to carry a sword in public, and the martial art competitions on the stage were forbidden as well. Public martial art competition were considered illegal, and offenders would be treated as murderers. This kind of event has happened many times in the thousands of years of Chinese history. Now, you may wonder, how come when I watch some Chinese movies, there are a lot of fighting competitions in old China, that sometimes people hosted public martial art competitions and the winner would be able to marry a beautiful woman? Well, my answer to this kind of question is very simple. A movie is just a movie. I always take movie dedications with a big bag of salt. Movies, more often than not, exaggerate or misrepresent historical fact. If you still want to believe them, then that's on you. This phenomenon is no different from how some people promote that someone created Tai Chi by watching a fight between a crane and a snake. We are in the 21st century. Let's be logical. Promoting a rational approach and cutting off the BS is another primary motivation behind my current video series. Ironically, in the middle of the late Qing Dynasty, about less than 200 years ago, Chinese military power weakened so much that the government had to repeal the law forbidding martial training. Back then, opium became popular in China due to its addictive nature and the rapid development of opium trade. It was said that a quarter of the male population in China consumed this drug. To change that, this situation, the government started to loosen the control of martial training in order to restore the overall public health situation. From then on, martial art practice, especially bare hand training, rose in popularity. So, the restoration of martial art training was partially contributed by the determination of discouraging people from consuming opium. This part of history is not that well publicized, since this is the rather embarrassing part of history. 
So, to summarize it, since the government in history discouraged civilians from possessing a weapon, bare hand training gradually became popular and evolved over time. Later, things totally changed. In the 1920s, or after Qing Dynasty ended, for more than two decades, the nationalist government made a great effort to promote the practice of Chinese martial art. The military began to use firearms and as a result, martial art weapons training became secondary not only in the military but also in civil society. Since then, bare hand training has become the most important training curriculum in Chinese martial art community. In my opinion, it was the first golden age of, a chi of traditional Chinese martial art in terms of its development, promotion, and prevalence. During this time, the first government-sponsored martial art academy was created. Almost each province and the major city in China had its own martial art training institute, and the martial art training became part of the Chinese life from then on. Most of the renowned martial arts and the many famous masters belonged to that period. After the 1960s, things changed again. I will talk about these two unique periods of history in the future. Topic 2. Imagery of a weapon in bare hand practice. What I have introduced in Topic 1 indicates that since weapon training was discouraged by most governments in Chinese history, bare hand training became popular among civilians. Very often, civilians imitate a weapon's training but in a bare hand fashion in order to avoid breaking any laws. This is a very common phenomenon noticeable in ancient classical training manuals. So, many barehand training manuals, even today, actually imitate weapon training method to a, to a certain extent. In other words, weapon training has had a considerable impact on barehand training. Effectively, Jin Wu Ling, or Forbid martial order, the law imposed by the government indirectly pushed the development of a bare hand practice in Chinese martial art history. Also, in Chinese martial art community, there is a tradition that a high level practice should reflect Quan Xie He Yi, or bare hand and weapon unify as one. This means that barehand practice should reflect the concept of a weapons training and vice versa. Based on this concept, each style would have its iconic weapon since the barehand training was originally rooted in weapons training. Furthermore, based on my imagery concept, Bare hand training applies the weapon's imagery in practice. Also, to a certain extent, a weapon training should reflect a bare hand system's characteristics as well. This is why in Chinese martial art community, many people believe that a weapon is just an extension of hands in practice and application. So, in bare hand practice, imagine and imitate that one is handling a weapon has a positive effect in making progress in martial art practice. This is another example of the imagery concept. Now, you may wonder, what is the weapon's imagery associated with each internal style? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 3. Internal style and their weapons imageries. As with other styles, each internal style has a weapon as its primary influence. 
因心意 ，it is the spirit； 因太气 ，it is the 春秋刀哦，官刀；因八卦 ，it is the 八卦刀哦 ，single blade sword 哦 ，broad sword。Let me explain them one by one。因心意 ，it is the spirit。First。Let's look at Xing Yi with cultural utopianism in mind. General Yue Fei, an important historical figure dating back to about 900 years ago, was famous for his skill with the spear to the extent that his name became synonymous with the spear practice. Since Xing Yi mostly involved spear techniques, people started to consider him as the founder of Xing Yi. In reality, Yue Fei had nothing to do with Xing Yi. Xing Yi practice has a unique body structure. Let's take Santi's stance as an example to explain it. In that stance, the upper body is tense. The legs maintain a comparatively natural wave stance. The hand position in Santi stand is akin to holding a spear. This is why people said that Xing Yi Santi stance is spear holding stance. Here, the term spear holding is actually the stealth imagery. One imagines a spear in its practice. Now let's analyze Xing Yi's famous five elements. Fist practice. Actually, it is just five kind of force or power training, which I have introduced in my prior video. Furthermore, it seems that one is imitating the five basic spear movements: strike downward, upward, forward, sideways, both inward and outward. These five movements are so close to five basic spear movements that, in the traditional training method, one always uses the spear to practice the five forces or five types of power. So, in the future, when you practice Xing Yi, especially the five element fist, please imagine that you are working with a spear. It will help you improve your practice. In Tai Chi, it is the Chun Qiu Dao O Guan Dao. We often see people practice Tai Chi with a double blade sword. That many lead. That may lead many of you to believe that Tai Chi's iconic weapon is the double blade sword. But if we consider Chen style as the older style of Tai Chi, as per all the evidence so far, then the original Tai Chi weapon was not the Tai Chi sword at all. Instead, it was the Chun Qiu Dao O Spring and Autumn Saber, which is long-handled saber. It was said to be the weapon of choice of General in the Three Kingdoms period. Because of this, the weapon is today better known as Guan Dao, or the weapon used by General Guan. The Guan family name became synonymous with the weapon. By the way, based on historical evidence, General Guan Yu did not use Guan Dao at all, and the weapon Guan Dao or Spring and Autumn Saber came much later. The earliest evidence of this weapon dates back to about 800 years ago, after the passing of Guan Yu. This is another unfortunate example of a culture utopianism misrepresenting history. Anyway, Guan Yu's preferred weapon is not our focus here. So let's go back to the main topic. Based on the latest Tai Chi research. Many scholars found out about a temple in Tang Village, not far from Chen Village. The temple was called Qian Zai Si or Thousand Years Temple. It was a big temple with about two thousand years of history. Unfortunately, 
much of it was destroyed during the so-called Cultural Revolution. Due to this incident and many others of the similar nature, I often call it the Anti-Cultural Revolution. In this temple, many interest practice existed before the time of Chen Wangting, the official Chen style Tai Chi founder. This included documents on Tai Chi theory, Tai Chi application, and other similar to even identical to latest classical Tai Chi document, such as Wu Yuxiang and Chen Xin's book. In addition, there were also a Guan Dao routine, and the list of the forms of that routine is the same as the Chen style Guan Dao routine practiced nowadays. It means that the Chen style Guan Dao was not actually created by Chen Wangting, the Chen style founder. It's very likely that Chen Wangting learned this routine in that temple or from someone that practiced in that temple. Some written documents from the Tang village say that three military officers including Chen Wangting learned Guan Dao and other practice in that temple. Now, when we look at Chen style Tai Chi routine, to many movements, it seems akin to practicing a Guan Dao. In the demonstration section, I will show you some Guan Dao postures and how they inspired Tai Chi movement. Due to these reasons, I strongly believe that the Tai Chi weapon imagery uses the Guan Dao. That brings up to Ba Guan. So, what is the weapon imagery used in Ba Gua bare hand practice? It is the Ba Gua Dao or Ba Gua Saber. Some people may say that the Ba Gua weapon imagery is the deer horn knife. Well, my answer is that the deer horn knife is only a unique weapon of Ba Gua. Uniqueness does not imply inspiration. So, the deer horn knife may be unique to Ba Gua, but it does not form the basic of a bare hand Ba Gua practice. When you practice Bagua, especially Chang style, a lot of movements are actually imitating a Bagua saber movement. For example, Nao Ho Jai Kui, which translates to remove helmet from the bike, a famous movement in Chang style Bagua, is actually based on the saber movement called Chan Tou Guo Nao or wrap around one's head. In the interest of time, I'm only providing one example here, but suffice it to say that Bagua is rife with saber inspired movement. Also, you may have seen pictures of some famous Bagua master holding a big heavy saber in their photos. That should give you an idea of the importance of saber practice in Bagua. Therefore, when practicing Bagua, I highly recommend you visualize holding a Bagua saber and I'm sure it will improve your practice with time. Topic 4 Demonstration Today, I'd like to demonstrate three movements, one for each style. First, Yin Xing Yi. A lot of the movements were inspired by spear movements. For example, let me first show you the bare hand version of Bung and the Pao. So first, Bung. Then, the spear. Right. So, lead kind of structure. Then, the fire. So, spear. So, this poster. Second, in Ba Gua, saber movement inspired bare hand movements. Let me first show you the bare handed movement of uh, Nao Ho Jai Kui or remove the helmet from the bike.
Now, let us see the saber movement that inspired this. Next, let's look at another bare hand movement. Dan Huan Zhang or single palm change. Now let's look at the saber movement that inspired this. Three in Tai Chi, Guan Dao movement inspired bare hand movement. For example, let me first show you a section of the second Chen Xiao routine, which starts from Dan Bian or the single whip posture, followed by Fan Hua Wu Xiu or throw water off of the sleeves. So. Now, let me show you the Guan Dao movement. Topic 5 Take Aways. Again, a lot of topics in a short video. First, relationship between bare hand and weapon training based on historical information has been introduced. Second, imagery of a weapon can guide the bare hand practice. Third, internal styles and their weapons imagery and demonstration have been elaborated in detail. That's end today's video. Thank you for watching, see you next time and enjoy your practice.